All right, we finished last week. We talked about uh, Paul in Antioch uh, in Persia. Uh, and his sermon to the Jews is very interesting, and I talked about it last week. Very important for us to take a look at that. And also the, uh, uh, the preaching he does to the Gentiles, um, because Luke is giving us an indication of what it means preaching the word of God. Uh, I know he uses that statement. But in this story where Paul goes to the synagogue, he gives us a detail, just like he did in Acts chapter 2, a real good detail of what it meant to preach the word of God. And uh, I'd like you to uh, go back and reread that. Uh, very important. So whenever you see preach the word of God within scripture, you know what he's talking about, this issue. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm We're good. glad to have you here. Yes. All right. So we're going to we pick up in Acts 13. Um, we finished up with uh, uh, 43, uh, 42-43. Uh, and after the meeting, this other synagogue broke up. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, they, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. And uh, what that means... Uh, continue on in the grace of God it means to continue on what God has given them to do, what God is doing in their life, to be faithful to God. It's another way of saying be faithful or fear the Lord. Uh, continue on in the grace of God. Okay, and we're going to begin today in verse 44, thir chapter 13, verse 44. Chapter 15? 13. 13, verse 44. Yes. Now the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was spoken, what was Paul spoken by Paul and revile him. And Barnabas and Bar Paul spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, meaning the Jews, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy for eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, this is, there's some really important things here uh, that we can sometimes uh, look over. Uh, first of all, we understand as the story of Acts uh, goes on, uh, it's uh, about the Jew Jewish per persecution of the Jews. And I think that's important because we always kind of want to interject uh, Rome yet. And Rome is going to come, uh, but not quite yet. Uh, that's going to be important when we study uh, the book of Revelation, when we get to the book of Revelation. Uh, that uh, at the time of the book of Revelation, the real persecution was coming from the Jews. And they used the Gentiles as well. They were a very influential group. Understand that each city had its own governor, uh, had its own uh, uh, council, like we did. And so uh, it, they would come, and the council and the leaders would try to keep peace in the city. And so when large groups would come forward, as you know, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, uh, they influence that. So that's going to be seen here. All right. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. Uh, I think that's a good idea uh, of how they addressed that persecution. All right? um, the crowds were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. This is going on today. You must have to realize it's going on. It has always gone on, will always go on. It is not a sign of the end times. It's not a sign of degrading of our, uh, of our national morality. It's just always been there, always, and always will be there. Uh, the people of God have always been a subject of persecution and oppression, always. Uh, uh, and we need to remember that, all right? This is important. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, this is important. It's not God who's judging them. 
It's they themselves, in the rejection of the gospel, have judged themselves. It's a response to that. They have, they have neglected or rejected the way of life. And so in doing so, they have rejected eternal life. Okay? Uh, and uh, now, this is important. Uh, this is, as we see in the New Testament, how they use the prophecies from the Old Testament. All right? Uh, I know today we think that the prophecies were meant for us today. They weren't. They were meant for the people back then. But the principles in the prophecies are, uh, uh, are prevalent today. And same thing in Revelations. We get in Revelations, we need to look for the principles because they are universal and they are etched in stone. Remember, a principle is etched in stone. It cannot be changed. All right? What comes out of those principles are the values that we place on them. That is how we interpret uh, those principles. And so what we see here is, is Paul is using this passage, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. All right? Very important. God has always been desiring to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom. We see this even in the law of Moses where they are supposed to take care of the aliens and strangers and those who come in. Uh, we see them over and over taking care of uh, those Gentile people. And when we studied the Old Testament, when we studied the Chronicles and the Kings, we saw that was true, uh, that those Gentiles were cared for by God and brought into connection with the people of God. And I think that's very important for us to understand that God works outside of us. It just not, does not work inside of us. He works outside of us. Uh, we cannot see it, but he works with us, but he also works outside of us in many different ways. And we saw that in Judges, saw that in uh, Chronicles, and we're seeing that here. All right. Uh, and when the Gentiles heard us, now remember, when he's talking about the Gentiles, he's talking about pagans at this point, not God-fearers. And he's talking about God-fearers. He didn't mention them, God-fearers. Uh, but here he's talking to the pagans. And I said that in Antioch there was a shift in the preaching. Now, not only were they going after the Jews and the Samaritans and the god fearers they were now concentrating on the Gentiles. But what is also important here is to understand when Paul was going into a new community, he first went to the synagogue. And of course, being a visitor to that city, he was often asked to uh, convey a message, and he would. So it was more opportunity for him. But he went to the Jews first. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because the Jews, uh, Jewish Christians would help the Gentile Christians grow in Christ uh, because of the moral issues that are involved in pagan religions. Okay? Uh, and so that's why when we see Paul shipwrecked on that island for 18 months, he did not start a church there. Uh, and some people believe he did not because he didn't have the foundation. Uh, to build that. Uh, and so uh, some people connect that with Paul, why he went to the synagogue first. Jewish, early Jewish Christians, and we're going to learn this later on, early Jewish Christians uh, still kept uh, uh, the Jewish traditions. Uh, and, uh, and it even meant going to the synagogues on Friday night, Saturday, observing the Sabbath. Uh, 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 and so the struggles between the two groups are going to be how the Jewish Christians applied that to the Gentiles. And that's going to be a growing problem. And we're going to see that in Acts 15. Uh, the apostles have to deal finally with that issue. Okay? All right. 48. And so when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. What do you make of that statement? When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Who appointed him? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. What does he mean by those who were appointed? Could, you, could it mean that 
those who believed would be appointed the word of God? Like, like beforehand, the ones who believe are going to be saved. And the appointed may mean an overall indication that God's appointing those who believe to be saved, as opposed to individuals being appointed, like a predestination. Yeah, that's what Does that make sense? That's the way I've heard it explained. Yeah, we want, we want to be careful that we don't uh, get into uh, God choosing who's going to be saved and therefore choosing who's not going to be saved. Could it be because God knows our heart that, he, <clears throat> that they were maybe before they heard, they were longing for something, they were wanting something, and when they heard, they believed, but they had already wanted it in their heart? Yeah, this, this began and still exists today, by the way. It hasn't ended uh, in different types of conversations. But this began, I say, in the fourth or fifth century between Augustine and Pelagius. And what Augustine said was basically that God approaches us first and we respond. Pelagius said no, human beings come first and they find God. And Augustine would say, well, where do they find God? Under a tree? Under a rock? And that's very important for us to realize there's really a, a deep bias in us uh, to think that somehow we are connected first to God. And I've heard this so many times uh, that I, I have to kind of repeat this. It is God who acts first. And he did so in this lesson right here by showing that it was the preaching of the Lord and the response that was made, the rejoicing and glorifying word of the Lord, that is what appointed them, was their response to the preaching of the Lord. In complete opposite to those who didn't believe, who then brought judgment upon themselves because they did not believe eternal life. So appointed doesn't mean that God's pointing his finger and he's saying, you, Doug Vile, uh, I'm going to save you, but your brother and sister, I'm sorry, uh, they're lost. No, he's not saying that at all. And be careful about that. And be ready to explain. If somebody points out this passage to you, be ready to explain, no, that's not what that passage talks about. The context of that passage is about those who respond to the Lord, the preaching of the Lord. That is so important for us to understand. The Doug, the, also this, the, this phrase right before that, what, after Paul quoted what he had been told before, uh, then the Gentiles heard that they said, wow, you know, we're supposed to get that belief or that message. And then it comes down and says, yeah, that's what God planned. He planned for them to have that yeah. message that he pointed it. So it is the preaching yes. for the gospel. But that's that's, that's the God. connection. That's the way it's done. Uh, and I think we, back in the early days of, uh, uh, of the Church of Christ, which was known as the disciples in those days, the Restoration Movement, uh, Walter Scott came up with the five-finger preaching of the gospel. Hear, believe, uh, repent, confess, be baptized, and of course we had the six, we received the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's very important. Paul will talk about this in Romans, that the preaching of the word of God is spoken and then was speak because they didn't have writings in those days. It was speaking. This has been such an important lesson in me, in my teachings, and in my preaching, that I always bring into somehow, some way, the message of the Lord. Uh, when we preach the word of God, we need to realize, yes, there are times we need to preach about morality and we need to preach about the church. But above all, something has got to happen in our worship services and in our classes that the word of the Lord is preached or talked about because we don't know who's listening. Um, I remember uh, the first time I, when I decided I was going to follow God, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, I was in the Gospel of Romans that day, and I decided I was going to go to church. And so I had to find a church, and I found one because I had been touched by being at Oklahoma Christian College. I'd been touched by, uh, you know, the philosophy of the Church of Christ or philosophy of Bible first. And so I had to look for a Bible-believing church uh, in New England. And I found this place called the College Church. And it was set up by a group of uh, 
Presbyterian people who broke away from Presbyterian and started a church based upon the Gospels, based upon the Bible. So I went there. And, uh, uh, but as I approached the doors, I noticed everybody was all nice and dressed up. Uh, kids, children had all their Sunday best on, everybody. And I'm sitting there with t-shirt and jeans. So I turned around and didn't go. I didn't go. I thought you had to be dressed up. So I went back to my uh, uh, apartment and I took out my Air Force <laughs> uniform and I started stripping all the stuff off to make it into a sports coat. And I had a little blue tie and a little blue shirt. I don't know why I kept that uniform. So the next Sunday I was all dressed up. <laughs> but that sermon w really touched me because something he said, he said that we are all broken people. Each and every one of us. And that touched me. That's why it's so important that somewhere along the lines we teach Jesus Christ. He has got to be the focus no matter what we're preaching. Uh, uh, what, what our song is. Uh, you know, um, please. That, I've always did that because of my own work. Walk with God. Uh, because it was a struggle with me, uh, and because I came because of what I heard. Uh, you know, it was a 10-year journey from the time of Church of Christ first, first taught me uh, and then finally becoming baptized. It was a 10-year journey. Uh, and so we plant seeds by what we talk about and what we teach. Very important for us to remember that. Okay, and when the Gentiles heard this day, we began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed, we talked about that, to eternal life, believed. All right, and whenever you see the word believe, uh, it's the same word that's used for faith. All right, so believe is a little bit deeper uh, in, in Greek language, early Greek language than it is for us today. Uh, I know you see a lot of movies and stuff. If only you believe, uh, not a positive uh, feedback. Believing is important, it is. But when he talks about believing in Scripture, he's talking about doing what is right and walking in the ways of God. There's a response to believing, and that is a change in life. Uh, by the way, last week I came across an article about Bob Dylan. How many people have heard about Bob Dylan? Songwriter, musician. Do you guys know he was a Christian? I didn't know that. He talked about how he was converted, and he was a Jew, and he was performing one day on, on the stage, and uh, he looked down. Of course, people always throw things on the stage, and he never pays any attention, but he looked down, and there was a silver cross, a silver cross, and so he picked it up. It's the only thing he ever picked up, and that night, he said he felt the presence of Jesus and became a convert at that point. He then put out some songs, uh, I think three, three albums which I downloaded, but uh, it, he talks about, uh, he takes the, a lot of the gospel songs and converts it to uh, a message. But he talks about it. It's very interesting. If you get a chance to listen to some of his music, I would uh, suggest that. <clears throat> but it talks about, I, I bring that up because it talks about what we do when we believe something. It's just not an intellectual acceptance. It's much more a change of life. Something's happened in us. And I want, I've always taught this, that whenever you hear a word of God, always think about the change it accomplishes. You know, I think there's a passage that says the word of God does not go void. Uh, it always has an impact. Uh, it began in the garden, began when God created the earth. He created it with his word. Uh, when he named the animals, he named them by word. Uh, we name people by word. And so word, the speaking, becomes important to us to understand this. Uh, uh, I, you know, there is this rush today, uh, in, uh, and I'm not saying anything about, bad about this, but there's a rush in, in thinking uh, and reading a lot about uh, outside uh, uh, biblical teachings. People are more in tune with 
uh, books about theology. They're more in tune with blogs about theology. I, I, I don't mind that. I think that's well. I'm a, I'm a, I do that. Uh, but as a church, we need to be teaching the Bible. And that's what this class has always been about, was to give you the tools that you could interpret Scripture the best way you can. Because it is out of this that power comes. God speaks to us through his word. Uh, it does not mean, no, I'm not going to get into that. All right. So we see this, the glorifying and rejoicing the word of God. They're excited. We talked about this last week, uh, that the word of God to the Gentiles was very important about the resurrection. We know that Paul in this talked about the cross, but he talked about it in terms of rejection. But he talked about uh, the resurrection in terms of vindication of God, that Jesus has been the faithful servant on earth. And I talked about this, this is so important, that Jesus' messiahship, yes, he was pointed to be a messiah, but he became messiah because of what he did on earth, his faithfulness. It wasn't just decreed to him. He had to prove it. He had to prove that he was the messiah. And that's what gave him the power to be our advocate. And if we study that in 2 Chronicles with the dedication of the temple, God speaks about the power of the king to forgive sins, the power of the king to bring healing, the power of sin, the power of the king to do this. But he also talked about the church having the same power. All right? Uh, we have the power. Uh, I know it drives, people, it drives people crazy when I say this. The church has the power to forgive prayers, forgive sins. By what? By praying to God, by praying to Jesus. All right? The ultimate uh, it comes from God. Uh, but because we don't study the ascension, we miss out on the fact that when Jesus returns, he returns in human form. The human form isn't left on earth in some kind of grave. It's not left in some kind of cabinet up in heaven. Jesus still has that human uh, uh, appearance. And that is what gives us the power. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, we sit on the throne with Jesus. That's what he's talking about. All right? He's talking about that we have, we are inside of that community. That God not only forgave the sins of flesh, but he took flesh into his being. And that is the most powerful message I think that can be brought out is that when Jesus comes in, Jesus just doesn't forgive sins on the cross. The cross is part of it. But it's also about us. That God brings humanity in its imperfection into the kingdom. And that's where we're at. All right? We need to understand that. Because there's a lot of thought about that kingdom being a thousand years or two thousand years or it hasn't come yet or will come. No. The kingdom of God is where God is in charge. And it begins here. It's not perfected. It will be perfected when Jesus Christ comes. Paul will talk about this in Romans. Uh, but it's already begun. Your resurrection has already begun. It's not going to be completed until then. All right, you've already been anointed with the Holy Spirit. God has already anointed you. All right? And as we saw in Kings, the kings had to go through several anointments. All right? Jesus had to go through several anointments. All right? So it's important to understand that when they're preaching this to the Gentiles, this is what catches their attention. Because their attention was when you die, you go to Hades. And where you go to Hades will depend on how you lived your life. Well, some of that's true. However, understanding that it's our faith in God that transforms us over that judgment, over that judgment. We've always been given eternal life. It's always been appointed to us. That means when the day of judgment comes, we're not there. Hallelujah. Well, that's right. We're not there. We skip. That's why Paul says there is no condemnation for those in Christ and Jesus. We don't go through that. All right? But God does expect us to do things. 
expects us to live as Jesus lived, to do what is right, and to walk in the ways of God. Now, we may set the values what it means to do what's right, and we may set the values of what it means uh, to walk in the ways of God, but those are different. Those will change with culture, those will change with times, those values, but what's principle stays the same, has been from the very beginning, do what is right and walk in the ways of God. That's still for us today. Now we may argue about what it means, uh, but understand we're arguing about values, we're not arguing about principles. Okay. All right, uh, 49, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, uh, but the Jews incited uh, devout men, women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they drove them out of their districts. Okay, for those people who believe that women were silent, uh, barefoot, pregnant in the kitchen, no. They had a great influence, uh, not only in society, but also in the church. All right? uh, women were not just basically in the shadows. And when Paul talks about his entourage, he will always include women. Uh, uh, and when there's problems in the church, uh, he talks about uh, taking care of the women. The women are very much a part of us. And I know that we have abused that at times and have been abusive about it and uh, has gotten me in a lot of trouble because it's an old tradition. And uh, we need to realize as we read the book of Acts, as we read the gospel, women were very much a part, not only of the church, but also of society. Uh, and so you ladies, you are just as important to the kingdom as I am, or any man is. Yes, you have different roles because we are different in everything we do. For example, when we call somebody, when women call women, they talk. Whatever comes in mind, they talk. When men call men, they have to have a specific reason why they're calling. Are you going to the basketball game this week? Yes, I am. Okay, I'll see you there. That's what they do. Women don't talk that way. Thank goodness. And, and he gets men are the worst he, gossip. He gets upset. The they are worse than women. The conversation <laughs> can go on. It needs to. It needs to. And, and Fred, we need to accept that. Because if we don't let them talk to, talk to them, that means they're going to talk to us. Okay? And that means we're going to have to communicate. But I'm there to watch the game. <laughs> well, uh, uh, first Terry and then Jerry. Terry? Well, I, I had just underscored that note here where it says that the Jews incited the God during women of high standing. And then, and then the follow-up was, oh, and the leading men, too, of the city. But the point of the thing was, I thought that's really interesting that, uh, Women were that first. Paul wrote it that way. The, the God-fearing, he didn't say the God-fearing men of high standing, oh, and some of the women of the city, but it's the other way around. I thought, it was important. I thought that was significant enough that I put a line under it because there was some, something important there as to as to why it was worded that way, uh, but, but then that the Jews, well, here's an afterthought, they, they went after the God-fearing women. If they could change their thinking, then they're going to go by and grab her husband by the neck and say, listen. My first, uh, my first paper in graduate school was about uh, women in, the, in, in American um, Christian at, and women made up the majority of membership they were responsible for the giving, they were, uh, and uh, they were very responsible uh, for uh, the life of the church, not just Church of Christ, but a lot of churches, uh, uh, women, and still today. There's an article I read just this week that talked about the role of women in uh, African-American churches and uh, how, the, how important they are. Women are so important, okay? Uh, you know, if, if you look at any video, and, and go back to the 50s even when they had, they called it film at that time, but uh, anywhere or any congregation that I can recall I have ever attended, the majority of the participants or the attendees are women. 
men are, we, we're, we're a bunch of jerks overall. Well, I mean, many of us are jerks, all right? But it's the women that seems to hold. Just... And, and they need to be honored for that. And they need to be praised for that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that's so important. Uh, I remember, of course, their struggles, you know, about leadership and women, and uh, they always quote that passage out of Timothy. And it, what it says is not that uh, leader, it, it, it talks about not so much leadership, but uh, acquiring that leadership in improper ways. Who, who are the people that teach our children? There are the women of the congregation. Very rarely do you see men, other than once it gets to teen, but it's the women that lead the children in the church. I think that so. I could not preach or teach if it hadn't been for Jerry. Jerry was a godsend to me. Uh, she, she was woken up in the middle of the night, and Jesus said to her, you need to go see Doug. Uh, you need to go meet him. He needs you. Uh, but a lot, <laughs> but uh, 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 it's true in a lot of preachers I know that I've come in contact with. It's their wives who do the work, uh, and they do a great amount of work uh, that give us the opportunity to speak. All right, uh, you see that. Uh, you see that in CJ's life. Uh, I have an A personality sitting next to me. CJ has. Married an A personality. Curtis is married an A personality. Uh, you know, and they're out there doing the work. And so don't be afraid uh, uh, to, to speak up. I know in many churches that I've been to, some of the churches I've been to, women weren't allowed to speak up, all right, or to voice a prayer. Forget it. Not in my class. You have the ability to speak up. I just have to say this. Remember that woman was created to be a helper for the man That's right. because God saw that he needed lots of help. <laughs> yes. In my case, yes. In my case, yes. Jerry has, has not finished that job. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, it's very important. Uh, Jerry. Okay, Jerry's first, Jerry. Oh, I don't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I have two thoughts. I can't decide which one to say. Um, well, I'll do the serious one. Uh, one if you look carefully at some of the uh, arguments that women have about being miffed about what they can and can't do. If you look carefully, you'll see a divide between going for the title and going for the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really what's the, at the heart of all of us. I mean, if you if you want to do work, do the work. Does it really matter? No, it's for God. No, I and I've seen that, in, and I I find that in my own life. I want to be seen as you know the important one. We all do. No, you don't. <laughs> She's out there pulling grass, pulling weeds, and it's 110 degrees. Because <laughs> I don't want to go to the gym. <laughs> anyway, it's just because you know, the whole the whole topic of women's role in the church, I think, has been really inflamed, and nobody's looking at that divide. Which, what are you looking for? The title, or do you want to work for God? And that's the same thing true with with preachers. Correct. We have the same struggle. Do we want the title, or we just, you know, want the ability to speak? That's but no, you can have to. Bonnie's turn. I Bonnie. just remembered the other thing I was going to say. She's I helping you. Yes, yeah, she's helping me. Okay. So after church is over, there is usually a long period of time between everybody's out of the building. Toward the end of that time, just take a look at who's there, talking. It's not the women. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Like we had to go home and fix dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I, I cannot pinpoint it in scripture, yes. 
but it was a group of women that followed Jesus and helped support him and his disciples yes. in the ministry. Yes. And who was it that anointed his feet? It was a woman. And who was it that went to uh, take care of him in the grave? It was women. All right. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. And also, who, who received the first uh, vision, of who was, was the first to see the resurrected Jesus? was a woman. Uh, I'd like to get back to what he was saying. Uh, it was it talked about it described the women as leading women, but it says they were worshippers, they were devout, not anything like Terry said of a position or anything that was relegated to men. They had a title. Okay, so it says that was what was needed, and I I agree with Terry. Uh, uh, it seems like uh, the gospel is, you're, everyone can be receptive to it and they can be a believer and hear it. But once that happens, there has to be a way for people to come together and continue that and encouraging that. And that seems to have always been a major role of how what the women did. At, in, in the church in the early days, and now you can look at all, like he said, through history. And I was just thinking about the congregation that I grew up. I mean, what pulled the congregation together was the women and the activities as far as the community and everything goes of being that. But the how it got to be done and how they were deciding how they were going to be trying to evangelize or whatever was seemingly regulated to the men, but that couldn't have been done unless they had something to go out and evangelize about, and that's seemingly what the women did. And I, I think that was the standard, right? and I think that's the standard, well, look at this class. I mean, we're going here, Doug is trying to do the leadership role or the instruction part of this, and he has that God-given gift and ability but who is gleaning all this and making it part of this community? Uh, you can see the, the mix here. And I guess congratulations to the women. You're, you're the one that's doing that. And I think what Terry was saying, that you look through history and that's the way it's done. I, I guess this is a challenge for me. How to, instead of saying, oh, that's not good or we men should get out of it, how do we take advantage of that in the idea of evangelism now in terms of what you women are able to be able to do and do so successfully? And I think that's, if I talk about the Church of Christ, I think that's one of our failings to a certain extent. We haven't used, we haven't used that capability. Uh, I, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just saying to myself too. We, We've said, oh, you men go out and do it, and sometimes we just don't know what to do or how to have the capability of it or society or our values change. But I think the women have stuck to something that matters, but I don't know how we take advantage of that through the leadership. I'm, I'm preaching. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Which reminds me of two things. Uh, the church that we worked with up in Danbury, uh, before we got there, had gone through a split and had come back together. Um, uh, there was about five or, five or 10 years of, between that split. Uh, but they will tell you, and they told me, it was the women of the both churches that got together and say, how do we, how do we steer the men to bring this church back together? And I use the word steer, I don't mean to you know, uh, force it, but it was the women who were talking to each other uh, that did that. Uh, one of my, uh, I just, one of the part of my first paper was about uh, the role that women played in the mission field. And they played an important role, uh, whether it was a single woman or whether it was the wife of a missionary, they were the ones who were out there in the community bringing in people. Uh, and one of the examples was that one of the uh, 
mission, missionary became very sick, and uh, his wife went out in the community and had converted so many people. Uh, and so even in the mission field, women play an important role. They're not just cooking. I thank good they cook. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, but the idea is that they do more. You guys, you ladies do more. You know, ladies do more than you will ever realize. Gwen? I always wondered how this came about that men were supposed to be the head. But you know, God created Adam from the dust of the earth, but woman was created out of the rib from the man. So, that's did because, that, you know? Yeah, that's God because God, God had already been perfected in man. So he had to take some of that perfection and give it to women. I'm just teasing. I want that because I've just realized I'm being videotaped. I'm just kidding with that. I am just kidding with that one. Okay? But uh, you're right. Uh, and I think it's important that we honor women and praise women, really, for what they do. Uh, you know, I go to Simple House, and the majority of the people working there are women. And uh, they're in contact with people. You know, I love Carpenter Place. You know, having gone through that in my childhood, I, I'm glad that we're reaching out to young girls who need that help. And I think that's important. Uh, and, you know, anyways, let's move on, because we've only got, we only did five verses. All right. Uh, the word of the Lord spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited devout women. Again, devout women doesn't mean women in the church. It means devout women in terms of uh, uh, Judaism, it's about Jews, when Jewish women. We're going to see something special later on about a woman uh, that uh, uh, does something really special. All right. So the. I'm sorry. What did you just say about women in Iran? Did no, no. In, later on. Later, later on. on. <laughs> I think I'm hearing aids on. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, my speech is, is trailing off. Your days don't translate. So, uh, uh, and again, I want to point out uh, that it is uh, uh, the persecution that's coming is local, and it's incited by the Jews at this point in the Gospel of Luke uh, and the Gospel of, of Acts. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Wow, what an interesting statement. Where does that come from? Shook off, shook off. Shook off the dust from their feet against them. Jesus. See, Jesus says that, didn't he? When you go into a place and you preach, and you preach the kingdom of God, uh, if you're not accepted, uh, you know, shake the dust off your feet. It's a way of saying, I've done my responsibility. I've done what was asked of me, and I don't take guilty. Uh, I'm not guilty for your rejection. Okay. I actually encountered that one time when we lived in Emporia, Kansas, and there was a group, and I don't remember what uh, what denomination they were with, but they had come to, I don't think Sue was there, I think just I, but um, they uh, they walked up the steps on the little porch we had there, and, and uh, was talking. Is this a church building that you're talking and, about? No, this is at my residence. Okay. Yes, our residence. And, Anyway, and I, I don't know, I, I, apparently I told him you know, I attend the local church, church of Christ there. A anyway, after we conversed a little bit, I watched as they stepped down. They actually did, did that little <laughs> thing with their feet. I thought, well, I thought, hey, it's biblical. I saw it. <laughs> I, I mean, that's just, you know, in, in there. So, yeah. so, you know, I mean, they were, they were okay in doing that, but that's, you know, that's what Scripture says, do it. You know, so they said, well, he's, he's a waste out of here, you know. But. Yeah, they're not, they're not placing any judgment on them. Uh, they're saying that we've done what we have tired to do. Yeah. We're time for us to move on. And it falls upon them. Uh, by the, now, in 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with Holy Spirit. Disciples does not mean the apostles. That's a different word in the Greek. 
This means disciples, Christians, who are following Jesus. All right? The disciples uh, were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And that's the, the contrast between shaking the dust off their feet and what the others who lived there were able to get with the Holy Spirit, with joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, this always intrigued me because we don't think of suffering as joy. We don't think of persecution as joy. Jesus went to Jerusalem with the, the joy. He went to, to face his death. Yes. He went with joy because he knew what was ahead of him after that. That's right. That's it right. wasn't happiness. No. No, and so joy would refer to the response to the gospel, response to eternal life. You know, uh, my main uh, preaching of the gospel has always been about a uh, new life that comes to us. And that process of becoming new life uh, has always been the center of my preaching, the center of my life, the center of my faith. But uh, I wanted you to know that there's two contrasts here. Uh, there's rejection and there's acceptance. And Luke points that out here, the story. There's a few translations translate that uh, convert into the Messiah. Yeah. All right, so uh, it's 1130, and uh, we finally finished chapter 13. Next week we'll start in 14. Uh, but it's important to notice what's going on in the culture, what the church is facing. Uh, uh, not just Paul, not just the apostles, but the whole church. Uh, and as we read this in Acts, I'll tell you what, uh, I, I'm ashamed sometimes about what we, what we suffer with uh, and think that's suffering. So uh, I'll open this up for any last minutes, uh, discussion and thoughts uh, that you want to talk about. Okay, this is a whole another kettle of worms, and you probably already discussed it last week when I was in here, and I was trying to catch up with you guys, and I read in chapter 13. John... John was with them. This is, um, this is, uh, of course, Paul, Barnabas. Barnabas and Saul. Barn. John was with them as their helper. Now that's in uh, 5b, and then up there in a 13, uh, hmm, verse 13, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. There wasn't any huff or anything like that. It was just, this is John. No, that's John the Apostle. John Mark. John Mark. John Mark. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And that becomes a sticking point between him and, and Barnabas, him and Barnabas and Jesus, Barnabas and Paul. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and we talked about that. Uh, and that struggle has been going on all the time. Uh, uh, we sometimes think. People aren't worthy because they don't do what we say or don't believe what we believe. Uh, be very careful with that, uh, uh, as we'll see. But it's, it is, when Paul is in prison, he does ask for John Mark. So there is reconciliation, even though there was a split between the two. There is final reconciliation with Paul in prison calling for John Mark. Is it the same John Mark that wrote the book? Or the letter of Mark? John. Mark. Gospel. Ooh. Uh, the Gospel of John is written by the disciple John. Okay, but the book of Mark. Oh, the book of Mark. It could be. I have to go back. I know it could be. I know Mark was an interpreter for um, Peter. And so that's where he gets a lot of his stories in the Gospel of Mark. He gets them from Paul Peter's preaching and teaching. Uh, and so uh, that's, uh, that may be John Mark. I'll have to go back and research that. Good. Yes. I'd like to challenge each of us to think this next week of what presenting the Gospel to the people that we come to today, it said that they spoke boldly the gospel 
what does that mean to us today in the culture in which we have the opportunity to tell the good news? That's a good question. That was asked of Mother Teresa, by the way. You guys all know who Mother Teresa was, right? That was asked of her. How do you do that? And she said, in every single conversation I had, I always brought God into it. Always. And I think that's important. Somehow in the conversation, we do that. I was with uh, one of my new doctors at the VA, and she mentioned God uh, uh, in that and uh, uh, talked about that. And we talked about God being very much a part of my life. And so that's how, that's how she addressed it. Well, when I, um, as, as I'm teaching the kids almost 40 years, this year I'm re-addressing how I approach over half the children that I will teach this next week, the lesson of Joseph, have been abandoned. They have parents in prison, they have foster care, you don't, you don't teach Joseph thrown in a well and being taken to slavery, do you? No. And that reality hit me hard as I completely changed. And I think we have to address that with adults, too. I think that's, that's an important point. And I'm sorry. Uh, that's something to, to, I really want us to think about that this week and see how boldly and how that changes how we respond. I, I, think that's key. I think it's very easy for us to circle the wagons. Uh, we did that in the 50s and 60s. We circled our wagons. Uh, and no, we need to be out in the culture talking about what God and Jesus has done for us. Uh, and that, that's so important. Uh, we do that. And just to look at your life and see God working in it. That's all you need to do. I mean, you don't need to, have to talk about chapter and verse. That comes sometime later. Maybe from somebody who can talk chapter and verse. But what you need to talk about is what God has done in your life and what God is doing in your life. And I'll tell you what, it's done through people. God doesn't wave his magic wand. He doesn't snap his fingers. He works through people. Works through people. And I think that's so important we understand that each of you are a vessel that God can use, not just in chapter and verse. You know, you talk about children uh, who have been abandoned, so to speak, in different ways. Ladies, there are opportunities that you have that I do not have as a man. And part of that opportunity is to walk into women's shelters and be volunteers in women's shelters. It's what you can do. I can't do that. They will not allow that. But you have an opportunity to walk into uh, those opportunities, to walk in and serve them, work with them, let them know who you are and that God cares for those women even though they're being abused. And I can tell you, I know what it's like to sit in your closet and cry because no one knows what's going on in your life. Okay? And, uh, ooh, seven minutes late. Uh, I want to talk chapter and verse. If you, you just said don't do that. It says, Now unto him who by his power within us is able to do infinitely more than we ever dare to ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church forever. Amen. Amen. So I finally found a, t uh, a sweatshirt uh, that says, my God is stronger than ALS. <laughs> yeah, so I ordered it. So I'm going to wear that. Uh, yeah, that's going to open up some doors. But uh, understand, yeah, it's so important that we understand the power of God. All right. Uh, let me see. Fred, do you want to close this in order of prayer? Sure. Dear God, we're just thankful to be able to uh, hear from your word. Uh, we're able to contemplate it. We're able to think about it. We're able to uh, share it one with another. And uh, uh, hopefully we uh, are letting it do something to influence our lives that we may be motivated to 
uh, serve you and therefore serve mankind. Uh, dear God, we're uh, mindful of the things that have been discussed here, uh, all the things that we talked about concerning prayers, and we pray through uh, your will that you will uh, touch us from time to time in our minds and our hearts of those people that uh, need our assistance or our help, and especially issues of health or issues of uh, dealing with troubles in their life that uh, through your providence you may be able to work your power through us to give them assistance at any time that we can. And we're mindful also of the admonition that we were given to think about how we could truly speak uh, your word and your gospel to our fellow man. Now at this time, we ask you to continue with our fellowship and learning, and we ask you to bless this food, the nourishments of our bodies, and we ask you to be uh, give those that uh, prepare it a, a great uh, admonition of thanks and uh, uh, know that uh, they are serving you by preparing it. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.